to make a, you know, kind of introductory thing. Okay, here at 6.30. So uh, let me just do my usual introduction and then you can go for um, how he wanted to make a quick announcement. Oh, uh, we have David Newby joining us. Uh, welcome, David. He's uh, also one of our former speakers. So uh, glad you could stop by. Hi, David. Um, hey. Okay, um, I'm gonna get rolling here. Um, my name obviously is Chuck Ogg, and I am with the Rock County Progressives, and we're continuing to meet here in the land of Zoom. We miss being in the co-op, and we miss doing things on a face-to-face -face basis, but uh, we're still we're still here out in Zoom world, and we're we're glad to see uh, so many folks uh, drop by. Um, we are a nonpartisan organization that's committed to promoting um, progressive values and action around progressive issues uh, here in Rock County and more broadly. Um, even though we're nonpartisan, we do at times have politicians come speak to us, uh, not this time. Um, this time we're sort of talking about the political process. And um, I'm really excited about our event. Uh, before we begin, um, Holly Denning wanted to make just a quick announcement, which is certainly relevant and germane to the topic. So you wanna go for it, Holly? Great, thanks. Um, so I had um, ordered some extra postcards for get out the vote efforts in Georgia for the Senate races. And I have um, a place, there's a place in Janesville to pick them up in a a bin that you can, you know, write them and then drop them off, um, uh, whichever. And I wanted to make sure people knew there were some extras in case you didn't order any um, for this effort. It's through Building Unity, which is also a nonpartisan organization. And they do have the same kind of situation in Madison. Um, there's Dropbox there too at the UU Church. Um, but I have put it in the um, chat that if you wanna order more through the 12th, they have, there's a link there in the chat. It kind of cut off the beginning of my message, but it says, if, if you or others want more, um, you can just order them there. But I also, if you just email me and put your email in the chat or just, hey, Holly, I want some <laughs> to share some of these. I ordered 250 of them and they come in 50, 50 pack, uh, pack of 50. So um, with addresses for people who are registered to vote. So let me know if I can help out. So thanks. Great. Yeah, we're all holding our breath, waiting to see what happens down in Georgia. And so if you want to do your part, um, that's, I guess, one way to do it. So cool. Thanks much, Holly. All right. So the plan here is that I'm going to announce our three speakers, and then they're each going to go one by one and give short presentations and um, leave it from there to uh, engage in Q&A. I do ask folks during the presentations if you would, wouldn't mind muting your mics and sometimes uh, noise can come in and, and just, you know, it can be distracting at times. And after that, we're gonna, we're gonna leave things open. Uh, when we first started, you know, I used to insist that people uh, use chat to ask questions. If you do wanna use chat, I'll keep an eye on it. I will prioritize that. And if things get too chaotic, I may have to step in, but hopefully people can raise their hands or at least ask questions without uh, stepping all over each other. So we can, we carry on here in Zoom world and uh, we're doing our best, so keep that in mind. So I am really psyched about, ton about tonight's presentation. Um, I think just to preface it, um, you know, we're already, most of, most progressives, I think, are, are feeling pretty good, at least about the presidential. I mean, you know, we, we, most of us kind of feel like uh, Biden wasn't our favorite candidate, but uh, certainly you can say his, his platform is probably more progressive than any winning Democratic candidate in a long time. And the winds seem to be moving in a progressive direction in the Democratic Party. Um, so we feel pretty good about that, but you know, we're already getting blowback on the down ballots. You know, why didn't the Democrats do as well as, you know, everyone thought they were going to do. And, um, you know, I guess that remains an open question. We have some already, of course, pointing fingers at us progressives and saying, oh, you know, it was uh, defund the police and it was Medicare for all that caused that to happen. And, you know, many of us, of course, are pushing back against that. We feel it's in some ways the complete opposite, that the problem was in mobilizing the base 
to what to the extent there was a problem and you know democrats should have done more along those lines and i think one of the most interesting analysis comes from to my mind places like mike davis who's who argues that for a lot of trump voters it wasn't so much you know the cult of the individual or it wasn't so much um you know they were necessarily thought trump was great or anything but they vote for republicans because they're in a they're in a very difficult essentially a lot of working people and small business are in a difficult place and you know they feel like they have to choose if you will between their livelihoods you know their businesses or you know lockdown and those are somehow the only and the republicans have convinced them that, that those are the only two alternatives and so as a result they go republican um and that the failure lies in the Democrats to provide a, an economic alternative for such people. How are they going to make it? Uh, and so anyway, so that's just some of the debate, just to, or discussion, just to sketch out how I see it. I'm sure our speakers have um, probably much more interesting or informative things to, set, to add to that, but we'll see. And uh, then we can all engage in the discussion. So that's the plan. Um, next up, um, I want to welcome uh, them. I'm going to give brief introductions for all three of them, and then they will take turns uh, presenting. Uh, we'll start out uh, Norm Stockwell. He's publisher of The Progressive, I, I think a great magazine that I want to encourage everyone to subscribe to. It's a long-running magazine that's been on the front lines for a long time. Um, for over 20 years, he was also a uh, work community radio station Community Radio's operations coordinator in Madison. His work has appeared in Free Speech Radio, Democracy Now!, and he's written for Z Magazine, among others. I only mentioned that because I was also published there. Um, Dan Kaufman is author of Fall of Wisconsin, The Conservative Conquest of a Progressive Bastion and the Future of American Politics, pub published by Norton in 2018, it's written for the New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, and the New Republic. Originally from Wisconsin, he currently lives in the Catskills with his wife and son. And lastly, but not least, we have Bill Leaders. Um, he's editor of The Progressive. He is author of An Enemy of the State, the biography of the late editor of The Progressive, Erwin Knoll. He was news editor of Isthmus. Uh, Madison's Alternative Weekly for 25 years, mm -hmm. and um, let's see. I guess I did. I did all three. Yeah, there we go. All right, welcome, guys. You want to go thanks. first, Norm? There yeah, you. thanks. Thanks very much, and thanks everybody for uh, coming out tonight. Uh, as uh, as Chuck said, I'm the publisher of the Progressive Magazine. This is the brand new issue just out so if um if you're a subscriber this should be arriving at your home any day now if you're not a subscriber there's lots of opportunities to uh, become one including on our website which i put into the chat uh, along with a link to uh, bill's most recent article about uh, justice uh, hagedorn so in terms of talking about the elections i think uh you know chuck you touched on a couple of the uh, topics that I want to go into a little bit. Um, I guess starting off by talking about how unique this year was, and of course the, the COVID-19 pandemic being the driving force of a lot of that, we had here in Wisconsin our uh, April primary, which by all rights should have been rescheduled as many other states did theirs, but Instead, we were forced to uh, have uh, a, a voting in-person uh, scenario that put a lot of people at risk, especially after so many polling places were closed prior to that April primary. So um, that certainly made the election unique, but also I think the, uh, the whole nature of our country in the past four years made this year's presidential election unique. And specifically, I'm referring to the, the plethora of uh, disinformation and misinformation circulating through all of the channels of social media, as well as a number of the broadcast networks nowadays, or cable networks. Um, and the other thing is just the strains on our institutions of democracy. 
you know, back when uh, Donald Trump was first elected, uh, I looked at some of the books that were coming out uh, about um, uh, the rise, the potential rise of fascism in the United States. And one of them was um, a book that was put together by Cass Sunstein, where he, it, he called it can it happen here, taking off from the old um, Sinclair Lewis title. And he basically, in a number of different articles in this book that he, he put together uh, by prominent authors, many of them said our systems were not meant to be attacked all at once. That what has happened in the past four years now we've seen is the strain on our democratic system is based on the fact that all of these different institutions and, and uh, organizations and uh, laws and so on that are meant to be checks and balances on each other have all been attacked simultaneously. And that really has put an incredible strain on our democratic system. And the fact that we were able to survive through this uh, election, I think is, uh, is noteworthy. Although, you know, we aren't done yet. It's not January 20th. Um, and most recently stories on the news about increasing violence from uh, people that are questioning still the results of the election, I think, um, you know, makes us, makes us need to be cautious in the weeks that come. Um, this issue that uh, has been raised about, you know, why did the down ballot races do so poorly? I think What's interesting is if you look at the data, in a lot of ways, a lot of the election was a, um, a referendum for incumbency. That is, for the most part, people who were in office stayed in office. There wasn't a lot of big upsets, but there were a few. And the few that there were, it's, it's interesting to take a look at them. Um, what we did see is that wherever progressive candidates were on the ballot, uh, particularly in the House of Representatives, but also in other places, they kept their seats. They were able to fight off uh, challenges from, from the right. And the other thing is a lot of ballot measures that passed during this election were very progressive. Things like school funding referenda in states across the country, things like legalization of marijuana, decriminalization of marijuana in many different uh, uh, local state elections. So I think that that's, that's important to take a look at. Um, so this notion of, you know, well, Joe Biden didn't have any coattails. Well, I think really it's more an issue of where were people running on progressive platforms and pushing progressive ballot initiatives and so on. And that I think is the place to look. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the state of Georgia. And the state of Georgia, was you know sort of a miraculous flip um, from uh, red to blue, and the reason for that is because Stacey Abrams and a number of other people started organizing several years ago to get out the vote and to reshape the political landscape of that state. And so what that says is you know elections don't just happen on. November 3rd or in the weeks leading up to November 3rd. Elections require active person-to-person -person community organizing throughout many, many years to build a base and to build an organization. And that's what we saw in Georgia. And I think that is going to play into this uh, Senate runoffs that we're going to see on January 5th in Georgia, which are obviously very, very important because they really do determine a couple of things. One is they determine whether or not the Senate is going to flip, which is a major issue, but they also determine whether or not an incoming Biden administration is going to be able to move their agenda. And I want to talk about that for a little bit because the um, the platform of the Democratic Party this year was a very progressive platform, but the reason it was a very progressive platform was because progressive forces were able to bargain and meet with other people in that um, in those rooms and make that a progressive platform. It was the fact that Bernie Sanders did stay in the race as long as he did after all of the other uh, contenders had dropped out, that he was able to keep those delegates and keep those forces and 
put influence on the development of that platform that was uh, put together by joint committees. And, and we saw that in 2016 as well, by the way, the, um, the influence of the, the Bernie Sanders supporters on Hillary Clinton's platform in 2016 was also very strong. So I think that's a, it's a good strategy and one that should be um, remembered. Um, the other thing, of course, about an incoming Biden administration is the next job that uh, progressives have is to continue to hold his feet to the fire. You know, there's uh, the famous story about um, uh, Roosevelt saying to A. Philip Randolph, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but you've got to make me do it. And then Obama, of course, repeated that uh, slogan to people uh, early in his presidency. But you know, we have a party that has a progressive platform. We have an electorate, the Democratic electorate, that is very supportive of a lot of these progressive ideas, like Medicare for all, like eliminating student loan debt, and so on. And people's, people must now keep that pressure on to push those initiatives uh, and not just go to sleep for another four years and wait for the next presidential election. And that again gets back to what I was saying about the Senate. Um, finally, I think that uh, you know some things may come out of this year's election. I think that more than ever this year, people are talking about the Electoral College, even more than in the year 2000, um, when the Electoral College obviously was was very much um, uh, in in discussion. But I think that people are talking about that, and it's very possible that there will be some move to uh, to try and reform or eliminate the Electoral College. Similarly, um, there's a lot of conversation now, and particularly since the passing of John Lewis, about the idea of adding voting rights into the US Constitution. The US Constitution does not currently provide a, an explicit right for all uh, citizens in the United States to vote. And so, you know, I think that it's time maybe for uh, for people to start taking a look at that issue. And certainly that's something that um, has been discussed uh, in many progressive circles, as well as uh, in some of the more uh, mainstream Democratic Party circles. Um, so that's those are my my things I want to talk about. I guess the one other thing, of course, Wisconsin is uh, is now the laughing stock of uh, of the United States because we did not, we were the only state not to meet our uh, our deadline um, for uh, uh, the, the so-called safe harbor deadline for certifying the uh, the votes. And that in part due to these crazy lawsuits that the Trump campaign has been pushing on all of us. And I just read moments before we got on the call here that 17 states have said they support the Texas suit, uh, which is trying to overturn the votes in Wisconsin. So it's, it's something that uh, we need to keep an eye on and could potentially um, go to the Supreme Court if, um, if enough states uh, push that uh, issue. So uh, anyway, that's my uh, that's my set of comments. I'm I'm really pleased that Dan Kaufman could join us. And Dan, I don't know if you brought your book along, but I have one to hold up here. Um, this Thank is you, uh, this is Dan's wonderful, wonderful book, The Fall of Wisconsin. We did an excerpt of it in the Progressive Magazine uh, right when it first came out. Uh, but there's a lot more pages in here than just the excerpt that we ran. So I encourage you to. Uh, to pick one of those up. And actually you can uh, go to our, our website. We have a, uh, um, a little store there. If you make a donation to the Progressive, we have some copies of this book that uh, Dan generously gave us. And uh, so you can pick one up that way as well. Uh, but Dan Kaufman, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's nice to be with you all. And thanks, uh, it was great, Norm. Um, and the book is, you know, um, sadly maybe still somewhat relevant. I will talk a little bit about my view of the election, which I think is um, unfortunately more pessimistic than Norm's. I thought it was fairly disastrous for the Democrats. And I put that in the context of a situation that to my mind with the pandemic, massive unemployment was almost 1932 like conditions. I think that someone that was running on a clear message of economic populism could have done a lot better. And I think part of the problem is there still is this deep fissure within the Democratic Party about what it is they actually stand for. I'll go back to 2016. Um, 
a guy that maybe some of you know, Dave Pokwinkowski, a wonderful uh, union leader in Madison, nine months before that election told me, you know, um, I'm worried about Trump versus Hillary. A corporate, uh, a popular, a right-wing populist can beat a corporate Democrat. Uh, Scott Walker did it three times here. And it really made me think, and I published that quote in the New York Times, and it was one of the few uh, editorials they did a review after uh, that even posited uh, that Trump could win. And I thought that was very revealing. And I think when you look at what happened and the fact that things were really so bad, to me it was quite, somewhat shocking and uh, somewhat um, distressing to see that in, in the Senate, Democrats made almost, you know, virtually no gains. They lost in, in Maine, despite having $70 million uh, to defeat Susan Collins. Um, they lost a lot of state legislatures. They lost rural areas massively, particularly in Wisconsin. And I think that was um, really telling to me because as many of you know, the Driftless area in Wisconsin, Wisconsin resisted a lot of the trends towards um, rural areas, particularly in Western Wisconsin, turning red uh, for much longer. And in fact, Tony Evers made inroads in 2018 and that helped him win his narrow victory. Um, I also think it's worth remembering that in 2008, Barack Obama did run as uh, somewhat of an economic populist. And he criticized Hillary Clinton in Lorain, Ohio for supporting NAFTA. He talked about um, all the jobs lost to these trade agreements. He um, went around Iowa to small towns talking about enforcing um, antitrust legislation uh, because at the time hog farming was being consolidated there in a process that's very reminiscent of what's happening to dairy farms in Wisconsin, rural areas getting hollowed out, resentment deepening. Um, and this, this was all happening. Scott Walker seized on this as well. So I felt it was a very disastrous showing by and large. I mean, obviously Biden won, but very narrowly um, when you take uh, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia is about 45,000 votes is his margin. Had he lost that number of votes in those states, um, it would have been a tie in the Electoral College. And I very much doubt that he would have prevailed had that happened. So I don't know. I think that my main message, I guess there's twofold. You know, one can look at the roots of it going back several years, or you can look at um, something that I talk a lot about in the book that you're all probably really familiar with, um, a wonderful legislator that I'm sure you know, Chris Taylor, uh, we used to go to these ALEC conferences together, and um, that's in the book too. And one of the things she told me the night of the election of 2016 was like, you know, the Republicans have an infrastructure and we don't. And until we do, they're going to keep winning. And that quote came back to me during this election, because there is this massive infrastructure. There was a, um, you know, you look at groups like the Federalist Society and the Bradley Foundation, and all of these organizations, they're, they're there and they may lose an election here or there, uh, but that machinery is in place for the next time. And there is no comparable effort, especially with the destruction of the labor movement, which was one of the goals of Act 10, both in Wisconsin and nationally. So I have um, a fairly pessimistic, I, I left the election, you know, relieved uh, that Biden had prevailed, but um, also I do, I was reminded of what Dave and Chris said, and I, and I feel like, um, you know, it was also reflected in the kind of campaign that Biden ran they may have this progressive platform, but really his main messaging was around a return to normalcy, reaching out to suburban voters. And I think we underestimate the appeal of right-wing populism. There certainly could be a right-wing populist that would emerge that would be far more skillful than Trump, far less offensive. Um, and I, that uh, concerned me. Um, I think a lot of Biden's victory is due to just a kind of 
deep revulsion with Trump and the pandemic. I don't know if anybody here would think that Biden would have prevailed if it was not for COVID and the effect that it's had on people's lives. Um, so for me, it was a concerning moment and I don't have um, clear answers just to say that I do think that the mantle of economic populism, the only real um, chance for the Democrats to not only win elections, but enact policies that would really alleviate some of the problems is to win a huge majority like Roosevelt did. And in order to do that, given our system, they're going to have to win rural voters. I mean, the, the way that the Senate, uh, 40 you know, senators can block virtually anything, um, you're going to have to make inroads. And in an earlier time, there was a really strong tradition of agrarian populism. Bob LaFollette uh, in Wisconsin, it was particularly strong. And I think um, until that mantle is really taken up in earnest and in seriousness, they are going to have very close elections like this one was. So I guess that's my, um, my overall view. Um, and I will give the mic over to Bill. Thank you, thank you. Well, I agree with everything that my two esteemed colleagues said. I hadn't thought of any of myself, but I will say that I found it all um, on point and compelling. Um, it's interesting how Norm kind of looked at it in a very positive way by looking at uh, issues where progressives did well and races where progressives did well. Um, and I'm sorry. Um, sorry, I just got a, a little dizzy, excuse me. <clears throat> Norm, um, I thought it was interesting how you focused on the, the positives. Uh, and I think it's uh, used plain negatives that you can identify. Uh, I'm <clears throat> I'm not sure what to say. Um, I think that as we look to the look to the election, a lot of it I think should really be in the rearview mirror at this point. You can analyze it any number of ways, but the challenge for the progressives is for the future. Um, I think we need to think seriously about uh, a couple of lessons from this election, the reform of the electoral, electoral college, as Norm mentioned, and the fact that we need to have a guaranteed right for people in this country to vote that's unimpeded by these efforts to rig the game through redistricting or through voter ID and other uh, voter suppression measures. We need to uh, reform the aspects of our system that we know uh, can and have been corrupted um, by the president. The power of the president to pardon, for instance, has been clearly abused and there needs to be some focus on um, bringing restraint to uh, those areas where presidential power uh, has been uh, abused. Um, and I think, you know, collectively we need to recognize that the country is torn not just between Republican and Democrat, between sanity and insanity in some cases. There's been a complete uh, diminishment of value for the whole concept of truth among a vast swath of the American population. This is a very damaging uh, and frightening thing um, that will take years, if not decades, to address and resolve. The damage that Donald Trump has done will last long past his presidency uh, and will be something that we will be contending with amongst each other uh, as long as we can. I think at some point though, we need, to, we need to tune him out and to let the country go in a direction that doesn't have him, uh, you know, getting the attention that he wants and that he'll provide continual opportunities to continue to receive. So. I mean, that's another lesson of this is let's put Donald Trump in the rear view mirror as we look to the future. I think we can only hope. All right, um, give a big hand to our speakers for tackling this, you know, incredibly difficult question. Um, 
I think none of us know, looking under our crystal balls, what exactly what it's all about and what we should do next. Um, now it's time for Q and A, and um, I don't know. I, I want to raise the first question, but I want you all to join in. I, I'm fascinated by the question of rural voters and how to reach out to them. Um, you know, I'm, I listen to talk radio and Tom Hartman, of course, goes on and on about how we should, you know, the left should be or progressives should be supporting talk radio um, be, to reach into there. And sometimes I think we should put together a statewide speakers bureau where people promote speakers like I do here in Rock County. But, you know, hey, we should be penetrating the north and meeting those folks. And, and you know, getting to those communities. So that was just one thought I had, but I'm um, curious what you guys think, if anything we can do. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll jump in to start. I think, as you know, I'm a big fan of, of radio and I think that it is a, an important way to uh, reach people. You know, I mean, when you're uh, riding around in your car or riding around in your tractor or uh, working on a construction site, people are listening to the radio and it's an incredibly important way to, uh, to get messages out. And I think that it, it is very important for progressives to get shows on uh, radio stations that reach people, and so that's that's certainly something you know worth noting. I think that that's one of the institutions that uh, Dan was talking about. That you know the um, the left has not done a lot of institution building, and the right has been very conscientious about building in institutions and infrastructure. You know the. Um, the story of welfare reform where, you know, you have uh, the Hudson Institute and the Bradley Foundation saying, let's pay somebody to sit around and think for 10 years about what to do about welfare and then implement policy first here in Wisconsin, which then made its way to the uh, Clinton administration. Um, similarly, I read a piece in uh, early 2017 from a, uh, a young woman who had been raised in a uh, um, uh, uh, evangelical church and she talked about how they had been trained since they were very small to build for what ended up being the 2016 election uh, but really the candidate that they were um, would have liked to have been building for was Mike Pence who uh, more represented their their values but uh, the fact is that there were these young kids in these evangelical churches that were being organized to get out the vote as this as this woman was growing up and that carried through to uh, the 2016 election so you know those kinds of institutional approaches um, the left in general is very bad and left foundations are very bad at funding you know the uh, the old saying that the the um, the right funds ideology and the left funds soup bowls so you have on the one side you know people with lots and lots of money and of course we've seen this incredible acceleration of the accumulation of wealth in uh, just since the pandemic started, but also in, you know, in the last generation. And um, they will throw lots and lots of money at an idea, which will then materialize into legislation, which will then affect people's lives. And the progressive foundations tend to be on this sort of um, uh, transactional relationship where they say, you know, how many kids did you feed today? How many uh, homes did you build? And so on. And so it's a much different approach to, to funding. And as, uh, as Dan mentioned, I think the attack um, on the labor movement has really sort of gutted the, the, the ground troops of uh, electoral politics because it's the unions that were doing the door knocking, that were doing the phone banking, and uh, that they've been, uh, you know, eviscerated by these um, anti-union uh, laws like Act 10 here in Wisconsin, um, and also the Supreme Court um, decision that uh, uh, took place um, about four years ago. Um, so I think that, you know, that this institution building is, is key. And I do want to say, though, in terms of... I'll give of, an example here of an institution. Oh, please, yeah. Uh, well, in Wisconsin, you know, the Wisconsin uh, Institute for Law and Liberty has been at the forefront of uh, devising and defending 
uh, these various assaults on people's ability uh, to vote, it has been uh, effectively uh, countered in some situations by uh, lawyers on the left. And there is now a uh, new law firm that's been created to uh, do what Will does, but from the other side, from uh, by Doug Poland and Jeff Bartell, who wrote uh, a piece on the problems in Wisconsin for uh, our uh, September, October uh, issue. Um, they formed a new organization which will aggressively defend people's rights to right to vote, to access to the ballot, uh, and take on issues like legislative redistricting and the other uh, voter suppression measures like voter ID that uh, Republicans in particular have, have always sought to, to impose. So there's an example to your point, Norm. Yeah, the right. I mean, the right has has played a, a long a long game here, and that's where we have you know the packing of the courts um, that we've seen in the past uh, four years has its roots in an agenda that's been building uh, for um, more like four decades, and this you know starting with school board and county board and. Uh, uh, the courts and then the gerrymandering uh, in states like Wisconsin, North Carolina, and so on, uh, has really reshaped the, uh, the landscape of what people are able to do in electoral politics because they're now confined by these artificial boundaries. I can just say one, a uh, couple things on this question. Um, I think the rural, I think these cultural questions become much more prominent, I would say, when there is no clarity on the economic issues. And to go back to the Obama years, you know, a lot of these people in rural areas did vote for Obama. He won every single county, for example, in the Driftless area in 2008 and did fairly well in 2012, although it started to erode. Um, but I think nothing really changed. Their conditions uh, continued to deteriorate. And you now have, you know, Tom Vilsack, who's very tied to big ag. And in 2011, there was an effort to enforce um, a law from the 20s called the Packers and Stockyards Act. For the first time, the USDA would apply rules and this would protect smaller farmers, small, smaller meat farmers. And uh, the Obama administration caved um, to the meat lobby. So nothing was really done. And now you have Tom Vilsack being nominated again. So. There's a kind of cliche that's emerged like, you know, are people voting against their interests? But I'm not sure that their interests have been defended by either party. And so then the space becomes taken over by cultural questions. And um, you also have the consolidation of media. You have, there's a UW study that was just out. I mentioned it in um, a recent piece I wrote about dairy farmers for the New Yorker that um, there's about 190 hours of talk radio in Wisconsin um, broadcast every day. It's in every media market and there's a lot fewer uh, regular newspaper reporters covering the state house. So I think that has furthered the divide and the divide has been created a lot of it through this policy that was articulated perfectly by Sonny Perdue. And when it came to Wisconsin, the Dairy Act, Boney said, the, in, in America, the big get bigger and the small will go out. But that wasn't actually very different than what anybody has been doing since Earl Butts, yeah, Earl Butts said was, that. The, um, was Nixon Secretary of Agriculture. And in fact, I had a farmer say to me the other day, you know, the last person that was really on our side was Henry Wallace. In terms of really the small producer, the small farmer. And, in, and you had some incredibly radical movements stem from rural progressivism. There were milk strikes in the 30s and in the 60s. There were union organizing efforts. But as it's been consolidated, rural parts have been depopulated. Uh, schools are closing. The roads are terrible. And then it becomes things like Act 10, where you're stoking resentment against teachers, maybe one of the, some of the few people that actually have employee-sponsored health insurance in a community. It's very easy to do in that context. And that kind of, so I, I think in a weird way, the root of so many of our problems is really the lack of public investment on any kind of major scale. I mean, it's a pittance compared to what it was during the New Deal, it was about three and a half percent of GDP. I think it's civilian public investment is now like, half of 1%. So 
much. Of G so, and, and this austerity mindset has been propagated by both parties. You know, Obama in 2000, you know, wanted to do a balanced budget. He was willing to make a deal on social security. And I think unless the Democratic Party really clarifies where its stance is, there will be continued close elections and also the ability for a right-wing populist like Trump to go into the Rust Belt, you know, make incredible promises that of course he will not fulfill, but there's a, there's a yearning there. And of course there's racial resentment that gets inflamed much more in a context when there's scarcity like that, xenophobia and so on. And, you know, and Trump made inroads with virtually every minority group in this election, which was also deeply disturbing to me. And to ignore it, I think, uh, you know, one ignores it at one's peril. It's, uh, it was real and, um, and it was troubling. Dan mentions uh, Henry Wallace, and so I do want to take a moment to uh, let people know John Nichols has a new book out about Henry Wallace called The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. And we're doing a book event with him uh, next Tuesday, the 15th of December at seven o'clock that everybody's invited to. It'll also be on one of these computer things. But uh, if you go to our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, you can watch it live and ask questions uh, direct of John Nichols. Um, Holly raised the issue of um, broadband. You'd think there would be a public infrastructure as a way to reach into rural areas. Why aren't, I mean, Democrats should be pushing that more and do you oh, think yeah. that would be successful? Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of push already in the direction of expanding access uh, in rural communities to to uh, the internet. So it obviously becomes so much more essential in the age of COVID-19, people who lack internet uh, access, lack the ability to participate in education and uh, in, in, in the affairs of government. We've really seen, um, and this was actually covered in a piece recently on our website, uh, how the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, um, under the, the past uh, administration has tried to scuttle uh, public access to the internet uh, by reclassifying uh, internet providers, not as a public service, but as a, uh, um, I forget the, it, anyway, changed, they changed the classification and now the push is for uh, uh, whoever um, Biden puts in as the new chair of the FCC to uh, to try and get that changed back. But you know, there's other things too, I think that are worth looking at here in Wisconsin, there was a push to have uh, municipal broadband be provided back in the um, in the mid 90s, I guess it was and um, Scott McCallum in his brief uh, uh, stint as governor um, was uh, responsible for pushing through a piece of legislation that the, the uh, AT&T and uh, some of the large corporations backed, which made it illegal for communities in Wisconsin to provide internet to their citizens. And uh, when uh, Jim Doyle first got in as governor, I confronted him about that and he didn't neither knew about it nor understood the importance of it. But I think that, you know, that's a, an example of where you could have, and many other states do have, uh, community-based projects that provide internet access to the residents in their area. And it's, it's something that could be easily done. This whole national uh, broadband initiative, a lot of it's based on a much higher technology solution, and you can actually do it at the local level much cheaper and, and uh, easier. Okay, are there other questions out there? This is your chance to chime in or throw in a question. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here, bouncing around the uh, Chuck, wide I have a range question. of good issues. There you go, Maggie, what's up? Um, I'd be interested to know how people would go about reforming the electric, ele electoral <laughs> college. How would you fix it? Well, there is a, a, a measure that would achieve uh, much of the, the same thing as eliminating electoral college. It would take a constitutional amendment to get rid of the electoral college, but there is a uh, movement that has come into to being that would, the interstate, the popular vote interstate compact, it's called, in which states agree 
to vote for the winner of the popular vote. If you have a critical mass of those states, you can assure that the winner of the popular vote nationally is the winner of the presidential election without changing the constitutional reality of the Electoral College. I see that as uh, much more plausible in terms of a fix to the Electoral College and the constitutional amendment. But if it came first and people got used to the idea that uh, the winner of a presidential race was actually the person who got the most votes, like in every other country in the world, I think it would be easier to get to a place where a constitutional amendment could pass and should pass. Does the Electoral College provide, I mean, it exists for a reason, doesn't it? The reason is historical. Uh, Norm could probably tell you, or, or Dan, but basically it was done as a, a, a concession to uh, slave-owning states to uh, not have their uh, impact unduly overlooked. Yeah, I think that's right. And it does give, you know, the argument is that it gives small states a voice, but why that makes any sense because they don't represent people, which uh, is, has never really been resolved. But I think it, it does have its roots in slavery and preserving that system. Um, and yeah, it's, it's absolutely terrible. And it's given, uh, I think um, Republicans have won one election um, in, in the past seven, the popular vote. And, and that was also in 2004, you know, George Bush lost in 2000, so he wouldn't have been an incumbent. So right. even that seems suspect, but um, yeah, it's a terrible system. I think you have now three, at least three or, I mean, it depends how you count it, but you could argue that a lot of the Supreme Court was an act, was a lot of those justices were um, appointed by people that lost the majority of the vote. And that's right. another institution that mm -hmm. I think is totally reactionary and um, has incredible power, um, uh, especially now with uh, Comey Barrett on, on the court. It's, it's really remarkable. So that will also hamper um, any effort to enact progressive legislation. And that, again, speaks to what you were saying about infrastructure. The Federalist Society has been putting forward these lists of judges, and they're the ones that uh, get chosen from. So, uh, you know, you have basically a right-wing agenda providing the slate of candidates that then the right-wing president can choose between. So. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, Norm, I think there's remarkable cohesion on the right around mm -hmm. ideology. And this is the problem, like, there's definitely a progressive wing of the Democratic Party and there's a more moderate centrist and they don't agree on ends. Mm -hmm. And I think until that is more resolved and the progressive wing at times feels ascendant and yet Joe Biden, um, the embodiment of the old guard mm -hmm. won the, the primary, which was, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of need for infrastructure on, on the progressive side, but the right has the advantage of more money, but it also has this cohesion that um, is not there on the other side. There's a lot of infighting. And you look at the cabinet that Biden has appointed and there, um, I think I saw Sanders the other day say, you know, there really isn't, there's a lot of good people on here, um, but there's no progressive yet to represent all of these millions of voters. And, and I think that's right, so. Yeah, you know, uh, Loretta Ross was here in Madison, uh, uh, a couple decades ago now she spoke and she said she pointed out that the right organizes people and the left organizes organizations and so the way that manifests itself you have a poster for a for a demonstration on the left and there'll be you know 200 organizations and 20 people will show up at the demonstration mm -hmm. and with the right they'll have a poster and it'll have one organization and they'll have 200 people so you know it's definitely um a different strategy of of organizing i want to say one thing though dan you said earlier about how close the election was and that in terms of the electoral college that that may be um true in terms of there was you know a risk of losing it at any point right up to the very end but in terms of the popular vote you know, Biden's uh, margin of victory was higher than I think we've seen in the popular vote since uh, maybe Ronald Reagan. And, um, 
you compare it to John F. Kennedy, who everybody now, you know, regards historically as this, uh, you know, incredibly successful, popular president who ushered in a change, but he only had a, a margin of victory of 95,000 votes nationally uh, when he was elected in uh, 1960s. So, you know, the, you don't have to have a high margin to be able to um, have a successful administration and push uh, legislation, but it's certainly- No, I agree with that, but I think the right understands that much more than the left. I mean, yeah. or the so-called, or the Democrats, they will make uh, they will make compromises right from the go. And while I appreciate your point, Norm, I still think one, the election is won. Well, Hillary Clinton also won the, the popular vote. It doesn't right. matter, um, unfortunately. And the other point is that I think that it's, I mean, the conditions were so bad and Trump is so extreme mm -hmm. that you could have had a Roosevelt style margin and it wasn't that at all. And in fact, the Democrats in the Senate did terribly compared to what they, their expectations were mm -hmm. and in the state legislatures as well. So I don't see much of a silver lining in a wide, you know, relatively substantial win. I mean, the fact that Trump got 46% when the economic conditions were so bad, so many people hungry, so many people without work, um, I mean, I do think an underappreciated part of Trump's success is was the COVID checks and um, that going out, and that really did help people. I mean, he signed his name to it. It was obviously many people. But I really think he grabbed the mantle of right-wing populism, and that offset, um, you know, and the Democrats haven't been embracing their, their neoliberal economics for a long time, you know. And there's, there's a sense, I've done a lot of reporting in the Rust Belt. I, I covered a GM plant closing in Youngstown. I was in Detroit. There was a sense that Trump had betrayed them to a degree, but Biden was not positioning himself as the champion of the working class. He really, his messaging was about winning over sub, uh, suburbanites, the revolt, the kind of revulsion that a lot of people felt about Trump's style and manner and his horrible personality, but there wasn't a hardcore focus on the economic malaise that has gripped the Rust Belt and is going to determine largely who the next president is as well, because this area, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Ohio too, and Ohio is trending more and more red. I mean, I was surprised by that a little bit, because someone I admire very much there wrote a piece thinking that Biden was going to win Ohio, but Trump did even better there. So I worry that like some of these gains that become locked in and what happened in the Driftless area, you saw the rural towns coming out for Trump even more strongly than before. And uh, African-American turnout was basically flat in Milwaukee. So it's, it's, it was a very narrow victory in Wisconsin anyway. And I think that's telling, you know. I think for all the reasons that Dan has identified, close elections are going to be a permanent feature of our electoral uh, landscape. Uh, we're going to remain a very closely divided country, even as people are more engaged than before. So you have larger numbers of supporters for both sides, and they're always going to be breaking down close. There's a lot of talk in the uh, election in Georgia, the big commentator, the big um, recurring feature of the commentary on TV is that you've got these people in the Republican Party who have been, uh, you know, disparaging the very uh, integrity of the election, and that was going to somehow dissuade people who uh, support uh, Republican candidates in the Georgia races from voting, that they're just going to say, oh, it doesn't matter, uh, we don't need to vote. I don't think that's true at all. I think that's crazy talk. Those people in Georgia are going to be bombarded with messaging and ads. There's not a single person in that state who is not going to be practically pushed into the voting booth when, when it comes down to it. The idea that people are going to just walk away from it because Donald Trump has said stupid things about the uh, integrity of the electoral process. No, they're going to turn out. They're going to turn out in the mess. It's going to be a very close race, and it's very possible that the Democrats, they're going to lose, and it's going to be, uh, we're headed into a, a reign of, of, of 
div uh, divided government with the Senate uh, uh, and, and the, the, the House. Other questions? Yes. Uh, here, I'm Go for it, Ed. Hello. I'm at the library, so I got my mask on. And thanks, thanks all you guys for speaking tonight. Um, I just had one about conspiracy theories, and I Googled it today, and I'm just wondering how much support there is with the um, fossil fuel industry that money is, do they, in, you know, encourage it or, you know, push it along? I seen a, I did, couldn't, if there's any good books about that or? Hmm. Well, certainly the Koch brothers um, make have made a lot of their money, or now the Koch brother um, made a lot of their money through uh, the fossil fuel industry, and uh, that's the origin of uh, the funding for ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, for uh, AFP, the Americans for uh, uh, prosperity and so on. So I think that there's certainly fossil fuel uh, money that's driving a lot of the uh, right-wing uh, organizing and right-wing think tanks and so on and so forth. Yeah, thanks. And I guess the, the book, the best book on the, that is probably Jane Mayer's book about the Koch brothers. Yeah, I'd second that. It's called Dark Money. Uh, it's very good. Uh, yeah. I just read a book that's coming out called What If Solving the Climate Crisis Was Easy? Uh, and one of the arguments it makes is that people should stop trying to fight about whether climate change is real and just the people who, who know just act as though that's the problem that they need to address and stop continually giving ammunition and credence to this um, falsely and uh, this, this funded movement to sow doubt but even the very reality of climate change, to assume nationally the mindset that this is a problem that exists and we need to do something about it uh, and not be bogged down in the, uh, the, the false uh, dispute that's been stirred up by these moneyed interests. Very much like the uh, John Lennon uh, rallies about the war is over, just saying the war is over if you want it, declaring the war over and acting accordingly. Uh, uh, first, uh, the idea first promoted, of course, by Phil Oaks uh, a few years earlier. But What about the Koch brother who, uh, the one who's left, who said, oh my gosh, we made a terrible mistake. Do you think he's going to put any money into reversing his mistake, or is, that, is he just talking? I don't think he's going to put any money into it. I think the Koch brothers were never fond of Donald Trump. <laughs> he's continuing uh, to fund his regular uh, right-wing organizations. It seems more like a PR uh, stunt. With and and they, they there's some like on certain issues like criminal justice, they have it kind of overlaps with their libertarian um, ideology. So they um, have made some funding to groups that are genuinely trying to reform it. But no, I don't think it's anything more than just PR. Yeah. One other thing that's important to look at with the, uh, with the Koch brothers is they're not just doing things like the American Legislative Exchange Council where they're influencing state legislatures, but they're also getting institutes and centers and so on on campuses at universities mm -hmm. all around the country. And again, that's part of this sort of long game of getting a foot in the door and developing a relationship with an institution and then later shaping uh, policy and so on through their donations. And so I think that that's something, there's a group uh, nationally called Uncoke My Campus that's uh, organizing on university campuses all around the country trying to get these Koch brother funded uh, uh, operations off of their campus. And there's also a very good book um, called Democracy in Chains uh, that uh, talks about some of the, the ways that um, this right-wing economist James Buchanan was able to create a uh, a structure which was then adopted by the Koch brothers and used in their organizing. So that's Nancy McLean's book, Democracy in Chains, that I also recommend.
I just wanted to also second some of what Dan said economic, along the lines of economic populism. I mean, I personally think that the Democrats have to all, all offer a real viable economic program that's going to help working people for a change. I mean, they used to do that. that that's critical, it seems to me. One other thing, I see somebody in the chat asked about the fair maps uh, issue. And of course, that's something that's going to be coming up um, here in Wisconsin as we have the, uh, the census numbers. But the census itself is such an important um, thing. And it's been so sabotaged by the Trump administration. And so now uh, it looks like he's not going to get to uh, uh, have a say over what happens with the census because they're delayed, partly because of um, uh, errors and things that were introduced by uh, by changes that Trump made. So it's it's uh, but the census, which determines the representation around the country and the funding for uh, local um, governments and so on, is uh, obviously right in the crosshairs right now of. Uh, of the right wing attempt to uh, uh, redirect uh, resources. And that I think also plays into this conversation about uh, fair maps. There's a pretty active fair maps coalition. I'm not involved in it, but I'm on their email list. If anyone wants to get involved, I'm sure they could use the help. Fair maps and the whole idea of uh, and getting rid of partisan redistricting is interesting because the public is just overwhelmingly in favor of reform in this area. There's very little disagreement about it among ordinary people. It ought to be an issue that can be advanced with the right leadership and with the right amount of pressure brought in uh, on the lovers of, of power. Okay, well, folks have some more questions. I'm willing to go for a few more minutes if people are uh engaged otherwise you know we can wrap things up soon this world of zoom i think it's tough to go much more than an hour but uh any more questions folks let's see david newby asked where should progressive focus or energy to build progressive power going forward that uh, hundred dollar per thousand dollar question is the democratic party potentially a useful vehicle or just the only thing we have i throw in the last part <laughs> i say the last part yes i think it's the only thing we have <laughs> but progressive in the current issue which you know, I've shared it before. You should all get it, by the way. You should all make sure that you subscribe to the Progressive Magazine, support it through that. If you subscribe in the next few days, you'll, you'll get this issue, uh, which is just reaching our subscribers now. But there's a editorial in this issue which talks about some of the things that progressives can do, uh, goals that they can focus on uh, into the future. But yeah, the Democratic Party is going to be the vehicle for accomplishing much of what we would also have. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think also, though, it's sort of like a both and question, you know, we need to work to make the Democratic Party as progressive as it can be, but we also need to work to build progressive organizations and infrastructure in our communities. Some of the mutual aid groups and things that have emerged out of response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in cities like New York and uh, uh, Minneapolis, San Francisco, and so on. But these kinds of networks, it's all about exercising democratic rights in the world that you live in. And so whether that be, uh, you know, the political voting that happens every certain number of years, or whether that be building organizations, and even this one that we're participating in right now, getting people in the community together to talk about things, even when we don't all agree about all of the issues, uh, is a way to build democratic structures and move forward. And as we instill that in our day-to-day -day lives and our day-to-day -day operations, that will move us in a more progressive direction, I think. I'll just say one thing, and David, you probably know about this more than anybody here. I think maybe the most important thing is rebuilding the labor movement. Um, and that is happening in some areas in a grassroots way. And, um, you know, Biden is supposedly uh, make, paying more lip service to unions. I think there is some awareness that the, the massive depletion of 
labor has had a disastrous effect on virtually everything, any kind of counterweight to the right. So, but we'll see. I mean, Obama also made similar promises as everybody here knows and promised he was gonna march and so on. Um, and it's very, you know, it's hard to know how, how to do that. Um, but, uh, but I do think that that is sort of foundational uh, in order to uh, sort of rebuild the left in a meaningful way. Yeah, it's a struggle. We've tried to have speakers from unions around here, but I think they're kind of shell-shocked and they feel insular and they don't really know who to trust. And uh, we've tried, you know, because what's happened in Janesville and, and, and sure. we're gonna keep trying, but uh, it's a challenge. You should, uh, you might want to ask Dave Polkwinkowski. He's very uh, erudite and knows, uh, and is very versed, although he's not in the industrial trades, but he, he's, he would be a good speaker. Hey, if you could pass his name on. Sure, totally. I, I can't totally. write it down now, but if you could do that uh, I will. some way, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah, we've had Ed Sedlowski Jr., who lives in the area, but I think he's off in Milwaukee, mostly organizing teachers, I believe. I actually, he's in Madison now. He's in Madison now. Oh, he's in Madison now. God, Madison teachers, yeah. Yeah, okay, he's in Madison teachers. Yeah, yeah, I actually worked on his father's campaign way back in Pittsburgh. Yeah. He was an insurgent in the steel workers, and so we connected on that level. And he's spoken for us a couple of times, not a while ago. But yeah. All right. Well, gee, guys, I think this has been a great forum. Um, lots of great ideas, and... Uh, you know, I think we all agree that we progressives, you know, we've got to get out there now and push on on Biden and Democrats more broadly. I think at least, you know, a lot of people after Obama got elected thought, oh, he's going to take the ball and run with it for us. And we don't have to do anything. And hopefully that illusion isn't shared right now that we know that, you know, We've got to push. If Biden's going to become Roosevelt, it's only because we're out there making him. <laughs> we'll see. So. Okay, well, I think unless there's any burning questions, I'm going to wrap it all up. Um, I want to ask everyone to give a big hand to our speakers. You can do it by, yeah, there's a way to do it by Zoom, or you can just do it the old fashioned way. But I uh, just want to say thanks, guys. Thank Much you. Appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's get some reaction from our crowds here. Come on. Yay! Yay! Thank you. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. Great to know you're still out there. Look forward to the day when I can see you all in person again. Thanks <laughs> for the great. connection. Totally Thanks. subscribe to the Progressive. We need your support. Yeah. And, and do do come to our do come to our book event next Tuesday evening if you can at seven o'clock uh, on Facebook Live and also on YouTube Live. Uh, it's uh, John Nichols talking about his brand new book on Henry Wallace. It should be a great uh, evening as well. One of our favorite people, if you want to put that up, uh, if you want to join the Rock County Progressives and post the event to remind us there, and I'll try to remember to put it out on our email list. Uh, that sounds like a great event. I'll send you the, I'll send you the link. Excellent. Great. Okay, nice. well. I'm going to say goodbye to you all and end the meeting. So and, long. Uh, Thanks, John. Bye. Look forward Thank you. to Look Thanks forward so. to uh, seeing you all. I hope Thank next you week. all. Thanks Take care, so very guys. much. Okay. Bye bye.